Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desire is known, and from whom no seeks are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may truly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith, that shall love thy God with all thy heart, with thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, as to love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Glory be to God on the high, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. We praise thee, we bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee. We give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father Almighty. O Lord, the only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. For Thou only art holy, Thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, our Most High, glory of God the Father. Amen. The Lord with you. <coughs> Let us pray. Grant to us, Lord, we beseech thee, the Spirit to think and do always such things as are right, that we who cannot exist without thee may by thee be enabled to live according to thy will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from 2 Samuel, chapter 18, starting with verse 5. The king ordered Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently, with my sake, deal gently for my sake with the young man Absalom. And all the people heard when the king gave orders to all the commanders concerning Absalom. So the army went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was fought in the forest of Ephraim. The men of Israel were defeated there by the servants of David, and the slaughter there was great on that day, 20,000 men. The battle spread over the face of all the country, and the forest claimed more victims that day than the sword. Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick branches of a great oak. His head caught fast in the oak, and he was left hanging between heaven and earth while the mule that was under him went on. And ten young men, Joab's armor bearers, surrounded Absalom and struck him and killed him. Then the Cushite came, and the Cushite said, Good tidings for my lord the king, for the Lord has vindicated you this day, delivering you from the power of all who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? The Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up to do you harm be like that young man. The king was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said, O oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would I had died instead of you, O oh, Absalom, my son, my son. The word of the Lord. The psalm this morning is 130. Out of the depths I have called to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. If you, Lord, were, were to note what is done amiss, for there is forgiveness with you. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits for him. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. 
O Israel, wait for the Lord. With him there is plenteous redemption. The second reading is from Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 25. So then, putting away falsehood, let all of us speak the truth to our neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger, and do not make room for the devil. Thieves must give up stealing. Rather, let them labor and work honestly with their own hands, so as to have something to share with the needy. <clears throat> let no evil talk come out of your mouths, but only what is useful for building up, as there is need, so that your words may give grace to those who hear. <clears throat> and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with which you were marked with a seal for the day of redemption. Put away from you all bitterness and wrath, and anger and wrangling and slander, together with all malice, and be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God, as beloved children, and live in love, as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Then the Jews began to complain about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I have come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, do not complain among yourselves. No one can come to me unless drawn by the father who sent me, and I will raise that person up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father, except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to thee, O Christ. After preaching last Sunday right here in this very pulpit about making a confession, this morning I'm going to make a confession to all of you. I'm going to commit a liturgical sin this morning. I'm going to move away from the lectionary, from these four wonderful passages that's read for us so beautifully this morning. I'll reference one of them. Of course, I'll reference the gospel here in just a few moments. But I want to talk to you about a different uh, kind of, uh, a different book in the Bible. And it's this little book in the Old Testament called Proverbs. Of course, Proverbs is in the Old Testament, but it's more specifically in this cluster of books that we call the wisdom literature in the Old Testament. Wisdom literature like the, like the Psalms, like the Psalter, of course, that we recite each and every Sunday. Also books like uh, Ecclesiastes and also Job, two very interesting books that raise very phil philosophical questions about life. And speaking of interesting, the Song of Songs. The so uh, Song of Solomon, of course, is a very interesting book about Christ's love for his church and also about human love as well. But Proverbs is one of these uh, books that's a wisdom book in the Old Testament. It's called Proverbs because, you know, wait for it, it's got a bunch of Proverbs in that book, right? And these Proverbs are little nuggets of wisdom, what I like to call rules, R-U-L-E-S, rules of wisdom. 
Now, you've heard the expression, there's always an exception to every rule. And sure enough, there's an exception to every one of these proverbs. But they generally, generally put you on the pathway toward wisdom uh, in whatever situation in life they are addressing. And they're very practical as well in their nature. The book of Proverbs also gives to us some great philosophy behind wisdom. How do you achieve wisdom? And what is the beginning of it? What is the foundation? What is the cornerstone of wisdom? And there is one of those uh, wonderful verses that tucked away in the, in the ninth chapter of, of the book of Proverbs that says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now, it's not saying, of course, that, you know, fear in terms of I'm so scared of God, I'm just kind of quaking in my boots. God, ugh. No, it's, it's a fear, it's a reverence, or it's respect for God. You see this oftentimes in how people kind of approach the altar. Typically, people don't just, like, run up to the altar real, real fast. They kind of approach it with some hesitancy, with some respect and reverence for what that altar represents. And, of course, the altar is the presence of God. You often see people, when they approach the altar, they also do this, they kind of bow. They put themselves literally or bodily lower than the altar and what the altar represents, symbolizing that I'm putting myself lower than God. I have a great respect and reverence for who God is. But I also have a great respect and reverence for what God is doing in the world. God is a God who is active. He's an interventionist God. It's exciting to see what God is doing in the world and having a respect for that. And so in many ways, we can take this verse and say that humility, and that's a great sort of summary word for respect and reverence for God, humility seems to me to be the, the cornerstone, the foundation for the pursuit of wisdom. Putting yourself lower than God, being humble, but also for what God is doing out of the world. And, and Christians have always thought of this in two different ways. The first way, is, of course, is that, as Aristotle says, that God is the prime mover. And as Genesis says, that God is the creator of all things, all things in heaven and all things on earth. He's the creator of it all. All good gifts come from his hands. But the second thing is also important. That God has this tendency oftentimes. He just loves to use other, other things. We call these secondary means of grace. Fancy word, huh? First, fancy title. Secondary means of grace. We say in church all the time that God wants to use you to accomplish his will and purpose in the world. God wants to use you. Secondary means of grace. But God also uses other things in a, in a broader culture to bring about his will and his purpose. There's wonderful, there's wonderful things out of the, the culture that brings beauty and that beauty, of course, magnifies the most beautiful thing, who is, of course, God himself. But what about science? Science is also important as well. Science is also a secondary means of grace in scientific development, when science is actually doing good things and spreading goodness in the world. That comes directly from God, but it's also a secondary means of grace. It's scientists. It's people who go in labs, sometimes at the risk of their own health, and make scientific discoveries. Secondary means of grace. Primary is God, the creator of all things, but science oftentimes can be a secondary means of grace. But that raises a very interesting question as well. What exactly is God's will and purpose in the world? What is his will and purpose in the world? And to understand that, we have to understand something about the, the character of who God is. We have to read Holy Scripture and see in past history what he's done. And of course, as we read in our, our gospel this morning, you have Jesus, the sent one, right? The son of God, coming to this world and saying, I am the bread of life. And that tells us something about the character of God and what God values and what God loves. And one of the core values of God is God is a God of life. God loves life. In fact, he gave his own begotten son to come to this world so we might have life and have it more abundantly. So at the very root of who God is and what he cares about is life. Life in the womb, but life out of the womb. Life when you're, life when you're 7, when you're 10, when you're 20, 30, 40, 50, 80, 100 years old. 
you're fortunate to live that long. God cares about life. And life, of course, is the opposite of death. That doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that one out. Life is the opposite of death. Death in all of its forms. Death typically is summarized by the word separation. Because that's what it is. It's separation away from goodness. Separation away from God. Separation away from those things that are good. Life is the opposite of death. Now this life is, again, I want to emphasize this very, very much, it is both spiritual and physical. It is as much spiritual as it is physical, and, spirit, and physical as much as it is spiritual. And this is why when somebody contracts a disease or they're going through cancer, we always say that, listen, death may win this battle, but Jesus has already won the war. Because we believe in a bodily, physical resurrection of the dead. So our eternal life that God has given to us through Jesus is, of course, not only something that's spiritual, it is something that's physical and bodily as well. That's why you see Jesus caring so much in his earthly ministry by going out and healing people of their diseases and the things that afflicts them, and of their sickness. Why? Because God is a God of life. And so it seems to me there's kind of two different streams here. There's humil having humility, it is the beginning of wisdom, having humility, and having humility uh, when it comes to uh, having respect and reverence for what God is doing out of the world. And the other stream is when we understand the core value of God, and that God is a God of life. And these two streams, for me, come together when we start thinking about a very practical, relevant example of what we've been going through ever since January of 2020 in this very country. To say nothing of around the world. And that is, of course, the COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought much death and separation to our world. And that is, the, that is in one way, the, the one aspect of it where it is very negative and much of an evil, an evil scourge upon this world. It has brought much physical death. Scores of people have lost their lives due to COVID-19. But not to minimize that ever, but there's also other forms of death and separation as well. There is, of course, uh, life-altering sicknesses brought about by intubations and hospitalizations. We've heard of long haulers who have experienced COVID months ago but are still going through lots of life-altering sicknesses. It is also meant the separation from family and friends. Some people are now going on trips to go see their families for the first time in a number of years, separation away from family and friends. To say nothing of the horrific situation where somebody has to die alone in a hospital away from their family and friends. It's also brought, uh, another element is it's brought separation away from mass gatherings like the church being able to meet together and having the fullness of a parish life. To say nothing of the other community communal events as well, and the communal, other communal mass gatherings that bring great beauty and, and connectiveness to people's lives. COVID-19 has been a tremendous evil scourge in this world. But our God is a God of grace. Our God is a God of life. And a God has given to us a common grace. A common grace not just for Christians or the church, but for all human beings. And that is this vaccine. The vaccine is the antidote to this death. The vaccine is, is a good. It's a grace. And yes, it's developed by science and there's secondary means of grace, but it comes directly from the hand of God. Why do I say that? I say that because the jury is now in. We've seen the evidence. We know the data. And, of course, we have to, as Christians, always be be constrained and regulated by the best available data that we have available to us. But we've seen now a number of months of people going through the vaccination lines and getting vaccinated. And we've seen how uh, that it reduces all the kinds of things that we hope that we reduce. Reduce the uh, chance of getting COVID, not, uh, not 100%, but still reduces it significantly and dramatically. And also, if you do get COVID, it reduces the amount of uh, sickness and the chances you might be hospitalized or intubated. And so all that data is there by the CDC. You can all go and you can all see it. 
There's maybe some folks, though, and I, I kind of take my hats off to them. Maybe they've been a little hesitant. This kind of wise strategy of saying, I'm going to wait until all the other folks kind of go through that vaccination line and kind of see how they do, right? And so folks have done this, the, the COVID hesitancy. And it's a wise strategy. I, I wasn't part of that strategy. I was kind of like, first time, I'm going, to, I'm going to go get it. But some people more hesitant. But the jury is now in. It's been a number of months. And we have, of course, we all, you always see uh, outliers in every sort of situation in life. But the main is, is we're not seeing huge side effects. And we're seeing how this vaccine is very effective and very safe. It is, in fact, a good. It's a grace that comes to us from Almighty God. In fact, we could go as far as saying this morning that this vaccine is kind of like manna that has come down from heaven. Now, this manna is not going to save your soul. You need Jesus for that. But the vaccine can save your life. Now, you might be saying this morning, well, Father James, it seems as if you are kind of preaching to the choir a little bit here. Our church, St. John's, has done very, very well when it comes to getting the vaccinations and I, a vaccine, and I'm very, uh, very thankful for that. But it's very important for us, I think, um, first of all, to say that, as I said last week in church, in the one of the announcements, that our faith is somehow not on the fence. Our faith actually has a side. It's on the side of life. And it's on the side of getting the vaccination. And I wanted to kind of prove out that claim a little bit this morning. Not just to kind of make a drive-by claim, but to actually go through it. And also, even though a lot of our folks have been vaccinated, there's also, this is being recorded and placed on our website. I mean, there's some other folks that want to come to St. John's and hear a Christian message of why you should get vaccinated. And we say that strongly, why you should get vaccinated and why it is your Christian responsibility. But not only your Christian responsibility, but your responsibility as a human being in this world. But the other thing, too, the second reason I want to share this message with you this morning is that I want to give you a bit more armor to come out, to go out in the world and share this message of why you got vaccinated. Not just that you got vaccinated, but why did you get vaccinated? Because I'm a Christian, and I serve God. And God, my God is always on the side of life. And I always want to be on the side of life as well. I want to end the sermon this morning by telling you a little bit of a story from church history. The greatest American philosopher is a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards. If somebody tells you it's William James, you tell them he's number two. Jonathan Edwards is the greatest American philosopher. And Edwards uh, rose to fame in the 1730s and the 1740s in, of course, colonial America before the Revolution, of course, in the New World. And ever since the 1720s, he's always, Edwards was always fascinated with science, very, very fascinated with science. And the reason for that is because Edwards had kind of a middle-aged kind of mind. And the Middle Ages, they always cared about two things. They saw two things. They saw the book of nature, and they saw the book of Scripture. And both of those books were precious to them, because in both of those books, in nature and in Scripture, you have revealed to you Almighty God. That's how God reveals himself, because God is the author of both of those books, the, God of, the book of nature and the book of Scripture. And that's why so many people were so fascinated by science and the scientific discoveries, because they wanted to see the evidence of what God is doing out of the world. How is God using scientific discovery in order to save lives, in order to promote and sustain life? And Edwards was kind of this kind of person. He was a philosopher, and so he cared very deeply about what God was doing through science. So it comes to the 1750s, and he, again, he is already famous, and so the smallpox pandemic is, is raging throughout the New World. It came over from Europe, and now it's raging throughout the New World. And there's a new technology, there's a new scientific discovery for a smallpox inoculation. And so Jonathan Edwards is one of the first ones on the line. He wants to be inoculated from, from smallpox because he wants to show people that it's safe and it's effective. The only problem was that it wasn't safe and effective. Jonathan Edwards died just over a month later from that vaccination. I said, why in the world would you tell us that story when you're trying to encourage vaccinations? I tell you that story for two reasons. First of all, I trust your own wisdom that you understand that the science between the 1750s and the 2020s 
is vastly, vastly different. <laughs> I think we all can, uh, we can all assume that. But the second thing is, is here's a Christian philosopher that thought deeply about his God, was on the front lines, and took incredible risk at his own health because he cared about science, because he saw science not just in this sort of isolated, natural way that sometimes scientists talk about it. No, he saw it as a product. He saw it as a secondary means of grace. This is what God is using. And if it's about sustaining, about sustaining life and about saving lives, I want to do everything possible to do that. And so Edwards was right on that front line, getting vaccinated. We live in a world now in 2020, 2021, in which there's no risk to us at all. It's a trip down to CVS. No risk at all to us whatsoever. And I hope that, uh, so I hope that we kind of acknowledge and live into this heritage and say that when it comes to vaccinations, we want to be at the front of the line when they're safe and effective and when they're grace and when they're good, when they come from God's hand, it's been proven that it comes from God's hand. We want to be right there. Because what Christians care about is they care about life. They want to serve and glorify the great God who sent his only begotten son into this world, a son who stands in front of the crowd and says, I am the bread of life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now let us stand and continue our worship service by reaffirming our faith in the words that I see in Creed found on page 327. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, the very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who came down from the from his salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnated by the Holy Ghost to the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate, he suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. <clears throat> Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications, and to give thanks for all men. Receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. <clears throat> we pray for our clergy especially Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Poulson, our bishop, James, our rector, James, our deacon, Edward, Robert, Wallace, and Stephen, bishops retired, Jack, Kay, and Dwight, clergy retired. We pray for our lay ministers, especially Mary, Olivia, Emma, Kathy, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons. <clears throat> We pray for all who govern or hold authority, especially Joe, our president, Kevin, our governor, Bria, our mayor. We pray for those who are ill or recovering, JL, Mary, Leo, Chad, Gage, Bibi, Stephanie, Jason, Phil, Claire, Sarah, Betsy, 
Evelyn, Barb, Sally, Kathy, Jimmy, Jane, Vincent, Hannah Jane, Reggie, Manage, Kathleen, Tom, Bobby, Charlotte, Brian, Carlina, Charles, Kay. We pray for those who are in nursing care. Mike, Lavinia, Ina, Kay, Thelma, Danny. We pray for all members of the armed forces. Heath, Matthew, Brock, Stephen, Tyler, Greg, Brandon, Lane, Riley, Brooklyn, David, Gina, Shaver, Dane, Kate, Noah, Emma. <clears throat> we pray for those in need, sorrow, or adversity, or other special circumstances. Betty Ruth, Olive, JC and Alice, Cole, Helen. And in the diocesan cycle of prayer, we pray for St. John's Tulsa, St. Simeon's Home, Tulsa. We pray for those who have died, Robert, Mary. We offer special thanksgivings for Let us pray together on page 329. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word, and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Open, O oh Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O oh Lord, to comfort and succor all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life of thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of St. John and all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant these our prayers, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee. In thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with a full heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may be right in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, whoever has great mercy the promise of forgiveness of sins to all those with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 
hear the word of God to all those who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all you that travail and are in a heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to the end that all who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Please stand. The peace, Lord, be always with you. Amen. Good morning. I'm Catherine Wilson. Um, this is the second Sunday of our school supply drive, and I see that our box um, overfloweth, which is very exciting. Um, you still have one more Sunday to bring stuff, so if you haven't checked out the list of needed supplies, there's the link in your um, bulletin insert. Next Sunday, the 15th, is our Blessing of the Backpacks and our um, Back to School Bash, which is a carnival. And last time I checked, there were only 10 spots left for people to sign up to help out at that event. So if you haven't signed up yet, you should check out what's available and sign up. Thank you. Hi, my, my name's Joey Markham. I'm the hospitality chair, uh, committee chair. And I just wanted to let everybody know I'm going to be in the commons um, that where the coffee is. If you would like to sign up for the hospitality committee, we could really use your help. Um, we're just going to focus on the first two events, the back to school, which is on 815, and Welcome Home Sunday, which is the pancake breakfast between the two services on 829. Um, and then later on, um, we're going to be having a meeting at noon after the reception today um, for the hospitality that we are going to set up, you know, different types of tasks for volunteers to help for those two events. And then later on, we will we'll be appointing event chairs for any type of festivals or events. So if you have a favorite festival or event that you would really like to get involved in and be a leader, I would really appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Thank you both, Kathy and Joey. Yes, for the blessing of the backpacks, again, it's next Sunday. And it's not just the backpacks for kids. It's also for anyone who goes to a job and carries a satchel or whatever sort of bag. And so we'll do that in this service, a 730 service. We'll do that uh, right after the birthdays and anniversaries. So kind of bring bags up and kind of bless. And again, it's just a way of symbolizing as we go back to school, we go back to work, uh, asking for God's protection and asking for us to always take God with us wherever we go and whatever we're doing in our daily lives. Also, don't forget, Sunday, August the 29th is Welcome Home Sunday, and we'll have our breakfast at 9 o'clock in the parish hall, so please stay over on that Sunday. You can still have time to get done with the service, go over, have your coffee in the commons, and then come on out into the parish hall, and we'll have a wonderful breakfast at 9 o'clock. We'll be advertising what the fall will look like on that particular Sunday, and also be uh, talking about how you can participate in the fall here at St. John's, and we're looking forward to it. Uh, just th three more announcements. The first one is this Wednesday, we do this once a month. This Wednesday is our remembrance service in the Chapel of the Resurrection. It starts at 12, 10 p.m. It's always the second Wednesdays of each month, and it's a wonderful time to gather together to remember those that we have lost. And speaking of that, I want to make the announcement this morning that the funeral for Joanne Woods, the funeral for Joanne Woods will take place in the church at 10.30 this Saturday, at 10.30 this Saturday. The family has requested that that service be a mask-wearing service, and so we're going to accommodate the family's wishes on that, and so anyone who comes in the name, we're going to ask them to please wear a mask for that service. Again, the service for Joanne Woods this Saturday at 10.30 right here in the church. As I said last Sunday, we'll be, we were kind of looking at our uh, COVID protocols, and I have a little bit of an update on that. The vestry will meet in their next vestry meeting, and we'll actually add that to the agenda to make sure we're talking through our COVID protocols and kind of looking at those fresh and new, especially based upon what the CDC announced uh, most recently. Uh, the one thing I would make an announcement though this morning is, um, again, we have three protocols, uh, two protocols already in place. You can read about those in the bulletin insert. The third one we're gonna add this morning is, is for anyone who has uh, kids, two years of age to 18 years of age, two, to eight, two years of age to 18, that have not been vaccinated, there is a mask mandate there. We wanna make sure that two years of age at 18, they're wearing a mask if they've not been vaccinated. If they have been vaccinated, that is up to a parental discretion. Uh, but if not, uh, please, please have your kids uh, wear a mask, kids and grandkids. All right, any birthdays or anniversaries this morning? 
Confession number two. Last Sunday, I forgot the birthdays and anniversaries at the 730 service. I apologize. So any birthdays and anniversaries this morning? Oh, somebody, somebody was thinking about coming up. No? We good? All right, just making sure. Just making sure. All right, we'll walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God. By the way, thank you so much for the generosity of our people. And we bless this offering in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And for a Holy Communion, our Eucharistic prayer begins on page 333. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is meet to write so to do. It is very meet to write in our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who in the first day of the week overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, the angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord most high. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. All glory be to thee, Almighty God, <clears throat> our Heavenly Father. For that will I turn to tender mercy to give thy only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there, by his one oblation of himself, once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and his holy gospel commanded us to continue a perpetual memory of that as precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he gave him thanks, he broke it, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and saying, Drink ye all this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you shall drink it, in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dear beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we thy humble servants do celebrate and make you before the divine majesty with these thy holy gifts which we now offer unto thee. The memorial that Seth commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we must humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and thy almighty goodness vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and holy spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire that thy fatherly goodness mercifully accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all of the benefits of his passion. 
And here we offer present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and bodies, to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice unto thee. Humble be teaching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this most holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction. May one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy through our manifold sins to offer to thee any sacrifice, it we beseech thee to accept this our bound in duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses through Jesus Christ our Lord. By whom and with whom, in the union of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, war with that end. Amen. And now, our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia! Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. O Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, and take us away the sins of the world. Have mercy upon us. O Lamb of God, and take us away the sins of the world. Grant us thy peace. We do not presume to come to this day table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our righteousness, but in that manifold of great mercies. We are not worthy so much to gather crumbs into thy table. But thou art the same, Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood. We have more to dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the color of salvation.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank Thee that Thou hast feed us in these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of Thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and as assure us thereby of Thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we remember this incorporate in the mystical body of Thy Son, the blessed company of all faithful people, and also heirs through hope of the everlasting kingdom. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, and we continue in that holy fellowship, and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost, be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. And, I, and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God, and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you, and remember with you always. Amen. And now let us go forth in the name of Christ.